and then this. Okay, so like we talked about last week, I like questions. It's good if you brought your Bible today. That's great. If not, I'll be putting stuff up on the screen. Um, and we're going to talk tonight about the Word of God and what is entailed in that. And But just as a reminder that really what we're talking about is following Jesus. I believe that through the Word and sacraments, um, let's see. Are you uh, here for foundations? David. I'm in the library. Okay, cool. I won't set the alarm in case you are still going when we're done. <laughs> um, we're talking about following Jesus. I believe he's called each and every one of us. In fact, God, the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity, as we'll talk about, um, calls, gathers, and lightens us. So calls us, gathers us together, and lightens us um, with the word and with gifts. And so this is why you're here tonight. You're, we're talking about following Jesus. Uh, but uh, that's a, a wonderful journey and it's got a lot of depth to it. So we're going to be unpacking that. Remember last week then we talked about uh, the gospel. And what, how did we remember the definition? There it is. Let's say it together. The event of Christ Jesus told with its significance. And we went over rather quickly that it's, it's, Christianity is founded on a great, and as C.S. Lewis called it, the grand miracle, um, the resurrection of Christ, which then makes the death of Christ incredibly important and impactful and his life. But we now, through the scriptures, see that, you know, this whole, the person of Jesus is not just the resurrection, but the whole incarnation, God taking on flesh is the event of Christ. And then, so what? Like, what does that mean for us? And we started to unpack those. We've got lots of words up here. I know it's covered up a little bit, so I can put put us on the recording. Let's make it a little smaller. Um, forgiveness is a hugely important New Testament word. Peter names this in the first sermon preached uh, the gift of the Holy Spirit is something we receive in the gospel. We're redeemed. That word means bought back. So in other words, we're kind of, we're enslaved to sin, we would say, and he redeemed us. Saved, especially in particular, saved from the problem of death, but saved in lots of ways. We're made whole. That word saved in Greek can either mean healed or saved, made whole or saved. So when Jesus heals someone and he says, your faith has saved you, it also means your faith has made, you know, brought this wholeness to you. Um, the resurrection, just we are united with Christ in a death like his through the faith of our baptism. We are going to be sharing a resurrection like his someday. Another great word is God so loved the world. So we have a sense of being loved. Um, and then reconciled. I love this one. You know, when you're at enmity and you've got a problem and strife well new testament says that's our condition with god but in christ we're reconciled and god did that god didn't wait for us to do it god did it in christ and it's a gift then that we receive we have peace we are we are free free from the demand of the law to be righteous which is something we'll talk more about next week when we talk about luther um oh my goodness all kinds of of words that the New Testament uses to say, so what? What's the significance of the Christ event? Well, those are some great words there. Um, and, you know, we could take four or five sessions just to unpack each one of these, but this is a foundation. So we're just, we're jumping right in. All right, so there you go. That was last week. Um, and so a really important text that again, we'll kind of move towards next week a little bit um, for our Lutheran heritage and Protestant heritage. Um, I think it was the Diet of Spire um, in, I forget which, what the year it was, but it's the first place that the reformers of the church, Martin Luther, Philip Melanchthon, um, 
Zwingli, a number of others, they, all these people that were going with the ideas of the Reformation, they were called protesters. And that's where the word Protestant comes from. Mm -hmm. And so you, you know, you had the Eastern Church and the Western Church, and then at the Reformation, which again, we'll talk about next week, you, uh, you have the, the Protestant movement. But within the Protestant movement, there's all kinds of, you know, little expressions. And the Lutheran note is this word apart. Every, all Christians, Catholics, everybody believes that you're justified. That's a fancy word there for being made right or innocent. Um, that's that's what justified means. We don't, we don't say in English, for we hold that one is righteous. We, we, we don't use that word, English word that way. But in essence, there's one Greek word, justified and righteous, comes out of one Greek word. So we are right before God, not because we've done the right stuff and because we've fulfilled the law and done the works of the law. But in fact, apart from the works of law, through faith, and if you were to look at the entire chapter of Romans, you'd see it's the faith. Faith in what Jesus did for us, his work, life, death, and resurrection. So Luther in his Bible and the way he translated that word apart is alone. <laughs> and he felt that was the best translation. This is where us and the some of you have some Roman Catholic background, as I recall, a little bit. There's some Latter-day Saint background here a little bit or in extended family and, and other protestant things but all most people say faith's really important the lutheran note is that it's faith alone that makes you righteous faith in christ not any of our works you might say well so works don't matter or are they not important luther had to face this challenge all the time and he said no they're very important but they flow out of faith they flow out of the relationship, um, and those are separate. Now, the, the Roman Catholic Church will still, to this day, say that you have to cooperate with grace. So, so the reason I bring this up is not to put down anyone else, but it's to help you see the unique note here um, that everybody believes faith justifies, but the apart and how we understand that little word is a big conversation within the whole spectrum of christianity um for us we're going to say alone that it's not the works of the law and then it'll go on lest anyone boast so our justification our being right before god innocent we can't say well i did 10 percent, god or i did five percent or i did 50 percent all, all the only thing we can boast in is what christ did for us and that We've received that gift in faith, and we're going to cling to it and believe it. Now, this is different than what most of the way we think about religions working, but this is what the Apostle Paul says in Romans. We see this Jesus teaching this. And so when I say, what's the significance? I didn't get to that. That's the significance um, of the gospel is that in faith we are made right. And then we respond. So we believe in the importance of good works and loving your neighbor and all of that. And we're going to talk more about that. But we believe that's a response. Um, another way to put it is because, therefore. And we think this order is really important. In other words, um, we don't want to say because we did good things, God accepted us. No, we say because God in Christ, out of his sheer mercy and grace, has given his son to die for us and for his sake forgives us all of our sins. Therefore, we're going to love our neighbor and be honest and, you know, not cheat and not steal and whatever. You know, you could throw all the Ten Commandments up there. Does that make sense? This order, we think, is important. You go back to the Canaanite religions. You're, if you're like, well, I don't know who the Canaanites were, that's no problem. In the Old Testament, you had, the, you had God's people Abraham and Sarah and the descendants and the 12 tribes and everybody. So you had to, who were Hebrews, but then became known as Israelites. And then later than that, Jews, Jews from the southern kingdom of Judah. But God's people, their neighbors were Canaanites, and they believed in lots of gods. And in particular, they were agricultural based. 
And so what they believe is that we as human beings needed to do stuff to get God to make it rain. In other words, we're kind of manipulating God. And lots of ancient cultures and lots of religions were in this method. We do something here to get God to do something for us. That's a lot of what all religions are, truthfully. But the Christian story is different. We say we did nothing. When, when Luther said, when Paul says in that passage in Romans, apart from the works of the law, there isn't anything we did to get God to give us his favor. He did it out, out of his sheer mercy and love for us. It's a sheer 100% gift. God gives that, and then because of that, we do our good works and our things. And it's a, it's a response to what God has done. But you could look at all kinds of systems, you know, that, you know, let, we do stuff so God will bless us. And that's a contrast. Um, C.S. Lewis, talking about Christianity, said... Um, all religions are most other religions in Christianity are our search for God. In other words, we're trying to do the stuff to get God to accept us. But Christianity is God's search for humanity versus humanity's search for God. That, 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 I think that is helpful. All right. So all of that by way of review. Can I ask a question? Yes, you can. Please do. Just going back to the faith. Um, Sometimes I wonder what the Bible says about, like, how is faith actually measured? Uh, you think of acts of faith, meaning yep. that it's something that you do, right? And so um, it feels like there maybe is a, a condition in there still that we have faith. And how do you how do you really know? You know, we talked last time about the faith of a mustard seed. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes I struggle with knowing you can say you have faith, right? But how do you know truly that you do? How do you, you know you actually have faith? Yeah. I would say faith is evidenced sometimes by your actions, right? But then it goes into works, right? So I struggle with that. Yeah, it's a good struggle. What do you think? Well, I think that faith isn't often dictated by our actions, but rather the actions of God. Because sometimes... You know, when I'm going through something and I pray about it and that prayer gets answered, it tell you know, I, I can't sit here and say, you know, I have, you know, 20 ounces of faith, but I can say that whatever measure my faith holds, God saw it in some capacity. Uh -huh. And so how, how much of it I have, I almost don't, not that I don't think it's important. I think it is very important, but. I know that God hears me and I know that right. God sees me and right. knows me. So it's, you know, whether or not it's a mustard seed or 20 ounces or a gallon, right. it's, it's, you know, I think sometimes faith is, can be measured by, at least for me, by how God answers prayers. Helpful, please. Um, I think in the Gospels, it talks about by their fruit, you shall know them. Yeah. So there's evidence by what we do that that gives assurance that we have faith because we respond to what God has done by faith, which is evident in what we do. James talks about that. Yeah. I know Luther had a problem with James. Yes. But James talks about the difference between faith and, and works. Right. As you show me your faith, I'll show you my works. Right. So faith without works is dead, Gene. The, the yeah. epistle of straw, as Luther called it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. By the way, he called it the epistle straw, not because it wasn't important, but what did, in a manger, what's in the bottom of the manger? Straw. straw. And what did Jesus lay in? Straw. So so that's that's important to remember when we because Luther did struggle with the letter of James. Paul, very helpful. So, you know, if there's some works, then that's evidence that there's faith. You can't you can't you can't say, well, I've got works and 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 say that's it. Right. I, I it's it's like a train ticket that says faith on one side and and works on the other side and it says void if detached. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Yeah. And yet, one's on one side and one's on the other yeah, side. Yeah. So, um, helpful. Yeah. Yeah, please. Okay. please. What, what if you 
See, I don't know. I I absolutely believe. Yeah. But what if, what if you like uh, someone who says has a problem with the love thy neighbor's part? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, right. I struggle with that. Oh, oh yeah. Oh me too. Oh me too. I think other people can. <laughs> right. So does that mean you don't have faith? And this is where Luther would run in and say, Jason, ask forgiveness for that. But no, that is not going to separate you from God because God's mercy is not contingent on how well you love your neighbor. Because that's the works of the law. But that's we're supposed to have that whole forgiveness thing in us too, right? Yes, we are. But that's the other side of the train ticket, um, to use Paul's analogy. Um, okay. So we have faith. Our forgiving others flows out of that. Now, do we ever do that perfectly? No. In fact, we always do it imperfectly because we're um, we're going to talk. No idea, sir. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you for your honesty. <laughs> yeah. No. Other. This is this is really good. I'm going to go one further. We tend to think of faith as something we have and do, and then it becomes just another word. Our faith doesn't save us. Our faith in Christ saves us. So we cling to his word. So it's sometimes we think about faith. Do I have enough? Is, is, there, is there faith inside of me? And, and really what we want in faith is trust in God's word that he, that God in Christ has given us a promise. Now we're going to cling to that. You know, like Jonathan likes to say to our confirmation kids, God grabs on and then confirmation is our affirmation and us grabbing. But, you know, sometimes we're like just hang it on, you know. Now, I'll tell you a story since you asked this question. It just comes in my mind. So about, I don't know, it's been about six years ago. We had a retired pastor in our church. His name was Don. He hadn't been a member here long lovely spouse uh, and uh, and I really hit it off with him he was kind of a feisty um, old guy and pastor he kind of enjoyed being the thorn in the side of some of our denominations you know <laughs> mucky mucks and all that he just had a little bit of edge to him and I just loved that and and just solid Lutheran you know uh, Christian and and been a pastor all his life and he was dying of a lung condition where he couldn't breathe. And so I had gone to the hospital lots of times and I was with him the final night. And, you know, he's got one of these big respirators on, not a, he wasn't intubated, but a big respirator trying to give as much oxygen as he could. And we're trying to get the hospital to get him some pain meds. So he's not all, you know, panicked about it and stuff. And I had read some scripture to him and we're, we're talking and I got down really close because it was hard for him to hear. And he took off his mask and he said to me, Bill, do you think we're kidding ourselves? Oh my. Yeah. Hmm. Sir. Now, if our salvation is contingent on not having a question, not being completely sure. Not completely loving our neighbor. Right, right. not completely loving our and being having a sense. Because we don't want faith to get turned inward on itself. Like, do I have enough? Who are you looking at? What I would, what I did for Don is what I, I know. He, I think also, by the way, he might have been testing me. He was kind of that guy. <laughs> but I don't know. He might have really been. But, but you know, I, I said, Don, Paul says that in, you are in Christ. I can tell you that you were baptized into Christ. And nothing can separate you from the love of God in Christ Jesus. And I just gave him back the promise, you know, and he just grabbed onto my hand, you know. So, mm -hmm. so, so notice faith, we might think, do I have enough? Do I? That's why I said that faith the size of a mustard seed. That's really tiny. I think the point of that is don't worry about it. Think about Christ. Think about, you know, because when, you know, I can't tell you how many good Lutheran people, when you get close to dying, you start thinking, I haven't done a good job loving my neighbor. <laughs> or I haven't forgiven enough people, or I haven't this or that. Well, here's the good news. You're right, mm -hmm. and your sins are forgiven. 
And here's the other, my last answer, Patrick, and then we'll get on to the word here, um, which is the source of faith. Um, if you didn't have faith, you wouldn't even be wondering if you have it. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. I, I remember one person uh, I was working with, um, they were just so, this was not someone near dying, but they were, oftentimes I do individual confession and forgiveness. Um, Lutherans still do that, <laughs> even though we do a corporate one. Um, and, and I was trying to help them have a sense that they are forgiven. And they just, they just weren't buying it. They couldn't take, and they just were so crushed by something that they had done. And the tears, you know, I said, you know what? You would not be upset if God, the Holy Spirit wasn't in you. You wouldn't care. You wouldn't care. What, what? You wouldn't care if what you had done, if God, the Holy Spirit wasn't in you. Just like Jason, I'm sorry, since you, you put your love the neighbor part. If if you didn't have the Holy Spirit in you, you wouldn't know that, you know, I struggle with that love of the neighbor part. I don't care. You you see what I'm saying? So if you didn't have God working in your life, I don't care that I don't I've struggled to have to forget. Good, I'm glad I don't <laughs> forgive people. You know what I'm does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, because well, see, here's the thing the most of my life. Yeah. And I, I think we've talked about this. Sure. I've been an angry dude. Yeah. Up until about 10 years ago or so, yeah. right? Yeah. And and that all started changing or whatever. But I, I've i always carried a lot of guilt that I don't do the love thy neighbor or yeah. what is said to do in the Bible. Yeah. Does that mean I'm not doing right? Yeah. And, and I struggle with that a lot. Yeah. Yeah. And, and what I want to tell you is that in the name of christ you are forgiven and that makes you right before god the struggle the fact that you're now struggling the fact that you're now struggling with it is a sign that the holy spirit but i always have too yeah That's the yeah, thing. yeah but i'm not saying well the whole god the holy spirit's been working you know, okay. all kinds of that's things. It, that's it. I never thought about that. Yeah, so. absolutely. So that's what I want to say to Patrick, too. You got faith because you're wondering if you got enough, you know, or if it, you really have it. I don't know if I'm, I think, did we go afield from your question? Yeah. I'm a very linear thinking German. Yeah. You know, I'm always looking for the formula. Yeah. You know? And so it's it's a challenge for me because I I would prefer a very formulaic way of salvation. Yeah. Yeah. Um, than this concept, which is a lot more abstract and kind of squishy in some ways, yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Can well, I say maybe something? yes, please. Julie. Well, um, I'm just gonna share please. through you know the journey that I have. Um, if I have any struggle with one person, I pray for that one person. Yeah. Even though he's my neighbor, my coworker, or you know. Mm -hmm. Or my patient, <laughs> you know, um, just they were there, like you know, bubbly and hey, you know, I'm having a, a good day and you know, encounter people. But I always tell people that I need if you struggle with one person, you have to pray for them mm. because that's the only way because you know, you are uh, practicing your faith and mm. trust with God. And mm. I always recommend that because you know by grace even though it's going to happen now or later you'll see the transformation yeah and i'm sure it will also lighten your your life and you know your daily yep you know your daily you struggle know, yeah yeah, struggle. yeah hey that's a very helpful thing i think jesus says in the sermon on the mount pray for those who mm -hmm. you know whoa but again, that's, and that's a strive, that's what we strive to do. But it's so cool that our justification doesn't depend on our scorecard on that. So we don't get as human beings. No, it's a sheer gift. We do that now because that's what, well, First John, it says we love because God first loved us. So, so there's the because and therefore. Beautiful, beautiful discussion. Great question. 
I'm going to get you a linear answer, though. <laughs> so, I'm gonna, I'm, in fact, I know something, but I need to put a diagram up. So, I'm waiting. We're going to get back to that. Good. Other questions with what this little intro here will launch into God's Word. All right. I love this. This is exactly the way I want the class to go. Let's keep talking. Let's keep asking questions. So, let's think about the Word of God now. Because it is the Word of God as we're going to talk about it, that's really where the promise is and what brings us faith. We don't concoct it ourselves. And this is something really important for people to get. So what is the word? Well, when I, if I were to say, what's the word of God, you would say what? The Bible. Most, at least most Protestants would say that, probably Catholics do. The word of God certainly is the Bible, but the word of God is more than that. It is the Bible, but it's more than that. Um, so we might put an equal is greater than, you know, is equal to the Bible, but greater than that even. And so what is the word? We talk about the word, and, and I don't know that this is necessarily distinct to Lutherans, but first and foremost, Jesus Christ is the word, according to John chapter 1, made flesh. If you were to go to the first pages of the Gospel of John, it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And then it goes on, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So Jesus Christ, the person of Jesus Christ, is the Word of God, which has been with, is, is, is what we would call the second person of the Trinity, um, the one through whom all things were created, um, so when we talk about the word of God, we talk about Jesus Christ. But then when we also talk about word, clearly in the Bible, when the word is pre, it's something that is preached. Now, preaching has a negative connotation today, right? Don't preach at me, you know, all right? But man, it's such a good word because true preaching is not preaching at, but it's giving people the goods. It's giving them the gospel. And so we are going to say that the word is the proclamation of the message about Jesus is the word of God. And you might say, wait a minute, it sounds like the gospel. Yes. The word and the gospel are very intricately connected here. And then, of course, yes, the written word of God, the scriptures, the old, I don't know how I get rid of this little, put it up there. Okay, how about that? Um, uh, the Old and New Testament, 66 books of the pro of, of the canon, we're going to call. Um, and so let's just get that. There, there's the three things. Jesus, the message of the gospel, which we are going to talk about. The message of the word is law and gospel, and we'll, we're going to unpack that tonight. And then the Bible. So we think about three things when we think about the word of God. Um, when it comes to the Bible in general, who's got their Bible? Here's a good Bible right here. That's a that's cool. That's beautiful, by the way. My father had a red. Uh, oh, nice. Like, oh, I'd love to hundred years. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Like seven years. So think about this as a library, and you'll do much better. It's really a library of books. Yes, it's one unified story. But there's all kinds of books within the book. And they don't all run in chronological order. Like a lot of people, they're somewhat in chronological order, but it bounces around. And so sometimes people open this up. And what are we used to? A novel. So you start at the beginning. And, well, Genesis kind of reads like a novel. And Exodus, then it moves in Exodus. Then you get into Leviticus, you got all kinds of laws. It's like, whoa, what is going on here about God's holiness? And how can we be next to God and not die because God is so holy and we're not. And so you got all these rituals and rules and stuff in Leviticus. Um, and then numbers, which in Hebrew, the title is wandering. So then we jump back into the wilderness where the people wandered and wandered and wandered because, you know, they wouldn't believe. And so God didn't take them into the promised land. Finally, they get to go in the promised land, but then Moses gives a second telling of the law, that's what Deuteronomy, onomy, law, second telling. So there's, so that's what Deuteronomy is. And it's a long sermon, way longer than anything Pastor Bill has ever even conceived of. It's like, you know, <laughs> chapters and chapters and chapters. Well, so 
And then we get into historical books, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings. That's a novel right there about the history of Israel. Um, you've got poetry books, you've got wisdom books. You've, so it's a library. And then when we get to the New Testament, you've got four stories of Jesus's life with its significance. And then you've got a story of the early church in the letter in the book of Acts. And then you've got a bunch of letters by a guy named Paul to the early church. That the church very quickly said, wow, these are inspired by the Holy Spirit. And they began to copy them and read them in all the churches. And you've got some other letters from some of the apostles. And then you've, uh, then you've got this interesting apocalyptic book called Revelation in the end of the, so it's a library. All telling the story. Sorry, I'll get you back to John. Right. Um, but that's a good way to think about it. As we just, you know, I know we got lots of different levels of experience and in, in the faith and all of that. So think about the Bible as a library. I think that will help you. If you want the Bible in novel form, I'll, I don't have this on anything. Well, I guess I could have written it here, couldn't I? Yeah. Uh, um, pen. Let's see. Uh, no, I can't do it. Uh, so, the book of God, that is, if you want to get it from Amazon, it's on Kindle and Apple Books. It's called The Book of God by Walter Wangren, W A N E G R I N, I believe. Walter Wangren. He's a Lutheran pastor. I think he's passed away of cancer, but um, really cool writer. And what he did is he's gone and he's written the Bible in novel form. So you can start at the beginning and he pulls, he's, it's very scriptural. He pulls in, you know, so you can get a sense. If you're like, boy, how does this all fit together? That's a great book. A great book. So, yeah, please. Yeah, when I was uh, in, uh, in confirmation, I was never taught that. Mm. So to me, it was very confusing. Yes. You know, I, I never, I never got it in the right. sense. So, yep. um, so what saying this helps me to understand that there are separate. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I have people all the time say, Pastor Bill, I'm going to start reading the Bible. Yeah. Beginning to end. <laughs> and God yeah. bless them. A lot of them are very successful and that's usually very impactful, yeah. but usually they hit the genealogies in Genesis and go, what? Yeah. This person begat that person. <laughs> we don't have books that read this way. So, so you need some help. You need some help with it. And it's also written in an ancient culture now long out of date. So it, so lots of things can help. Um, but yeah. Th that I have a question because I've actually been looking at Bibles. Is yeah. there a difference between the Lutheran version of the Bible and the Holy Bible? Okay, so what you're, it's, it's a confusing world out there. Okay, <laughs> so I'll try and make this short and sweet and helpful. There is no Lutheran Bible um, or... Presbyterian Bible or Methodist Bible, but there are lots of different translations of the Hebrew Old Testament and the Greek New Testament. So the, the New Testament, all written in Greek, a little bit of Aramaic in there, which is a form of Hebrew. So, but you've got the New Testament in Greek, Old Testament in Hebrew. So you're like... Uh, Let's grab this Bible right over here. We got the New English Bible, and we've got the New International Version. The King James Version you've heard about, mm -hmm. probably, that before the New International Version, it was the greatest all-time selling Bible of all times. This has blown it away now. The New International Version. Okay, so I'm going to try and make this a simple answer. So there's different translations. I'm going to recommend to you some translations. You can write them down. I'll give you the acronyms. The NIV is good. New International Version. That's what we have. That's what you have. Yeah, it's got, That's it's not bad. It's got us a Greek, Hebrew, um, and as, like, it's, it's very big, though. Oh, wow. <laughs> wow. It's a study Bible. Oh, sure. So I wanted okay. something that was maybe a smaller Yeah. Version. So so, I'm, so the, the one I like the best right now that's more of this one's kind of a combination, literal and non-literal, but the English Standard Version is 
my my the one I like the most, which is really based on the revised standard version going back, but it corrected a number of things that the anyway, but the the English standard version is very good. The the version we read in worship is the new revised standard version. So it's N R S V. Um, that's a Lutheran favorite though, isn't it? Because like my my I have a Lutheran study Bible. Yes. Here, so so the ELCA study Bible, the Augsburg Publishing House, mm -hmm. uses the new Revised Standard Version. And one reason we like that is because when, like in the New Testament, it says bro the brothers, the, be because we know Adelphos included the whole community, including women, mm -hmm. the NRSV says brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So, and I, I think that's helpful. And that's that's one reason why we use the we use that on Sunday mornings. But so it is a favorite. The Missouri Synod, another group of Lutherans, use the ESV, the one I just mentioned. No, and I love the ESV yeah, too. That yeah. was the first study Bible I ever bought. Yeah, there you go. So, so Chrissy, what the, what I'm first telling you is there's a lot of different translations, mm -hmm. and I would recommend the New Revised Standard Version, the New International Version, or the English Standard Version. There's dozens and dozens of more. Yeah, I know that. that now, then, crazy. then your next question, though, is if you want to get a study Bible. Yeah. And I think study Bibles are great, but just remember that those notes are coming from a human being's perspective. Yeah. You got the Lutheran study Bible. You've got the this kind of study Bible and that kind of study Bible, and they're usually really helpful. But just know. That's not the Bible. Right. Okay. So that you want to have one of those in your repertoire. But I'm going to go and throw in another one that's a little bit. Um, I don't know if any of you guys remember the Good News Bible. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Good News. And, and that was okay. But a better one now, I think, is Eugene Peterson's The Message. It's called The Message. Do, it's, I don't like to use it as a, in Bible studies, but when I'm just reading, sometimes I like it because what he's done, rather than translating, okay, here's this Greek word uh, for justification, you know, he doesn't just say, okay, which English word is going to fit that one and translate. He takes the whole paragraph, what does it mean? And then use you know tries to translate the idioms and <clears throat> and he he's they call it dynamic equivalent. In other words, it's not a word for word translation, but it tries to put it into a way that thought makes more thought. sense. What's that? A thought by thought. Thought by thought. Yeah, that's helpful. So having one of those, having the message along, hmm. but I don't really consider it a translation. It's but it but it. it Kind of is, you know, but it's just a different kind of translation. So that's my recommendation. Um, what about the Living Bible? It came out with six same thing. Yeah, there's the Good News for Modern Man and then the Living yeah, Bible. Um, I think Peterson has done a jo better job th than those other two in, in really getting at the actual part. I think the Living Bible just kind of goes off the rails sometimes and trying to make it so understandable that it kind of changes what it means. All right, so Christy, great question. Everybody's got that question. And and there's actually a longer answer, which I'll get to in just a minute. Okay, all right, so there you go. Excellent. Some statements about the written word. The Bible is the manger that brings or holds Christ. See that? Look at that. It's a manger. Brings me Christ. That's what Luther said. Um, the Bible is a set of love letters to the human race. I think there's a lot of truth to that, but there's a lot. And then he'll go on to say, well, not all love letters are all squishy and lovey. <laughs> Sometimes it says, you, you know, you know, you said what happened in your day today and this and that. Or, um, so that, it's not bad. Um, this is something that uh, the president of my seminary many, you know, 35 years ago or so, um, said that kind of struck me in a book that he wrote, the Bible is indeed the norm for our life and the very heart and center of our faith. We do not worship the book, though, 
but rather we worship the Christ it reveals. So we want to be, this, this book is sacred, but it's sacred because of who it brings me and the story and the revelation of God that it brings. And I think that's a helpful distinction. This is, we are a biblical church here at Silverdale Lutheran, and um, we, our constitution uses the word inspired. So we believe that this book is different than some other novel in that, you know, I'm sure modern Christian writers were in, led by the Holy Spirit, but we're going to say this was inspired in a more distinct, direct fashion. Um, and our language is God speaking through the authors. This is why it's important. Like you read the Gospel of Matthew and then you read the Gospel of John and you go, wow, these are different writers. But same story told in a different way. So God speaks through the authors and it's helpful to, to recognize that. Um, our official statement of faith about the Bible is that it's the authoritative source and norm for proclamation faith and life so like when i preach if i get up there on sunday and say look you people if you don't give 10 percent of everything you have to the church you're not going to be accepted by god if i got up and said that you should go to our president and say Pastor Bill is not, <laughs> is, not, is not preaching the gospel according to the scripture. It's the norm. It's the standard. It's what I don't come up with my own ideas. I'm supposed to preach what this is preaching. Now, and most all Christians believe that. We have different interpretations of a lot of things in here, understandably. But we do say that it is the authoritative source and norm. What's not there is the tradition of the church or the pope or the cardinal. This was the set, and we'll talk about that next week. I could jump into that, but we'll talk about that next week when we talk about Luther and the Reformation. What was that, Jason? I want to hear that. You want to hear that? Yeah, I know. You'll have to come back. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What's the Lutheran position on the, some of the, some of the fundamental denominations? The Bible is the unerring and infallible word of God, every word of it. Absolutely. We're going to talk about that. So let me just do one more slide. Later, Great later, question. Fine. No, no, it's just right. You're right. Ne we're right next to it. So when we talk about how we interpret the Bible, I like to say, first and foremost, the Bible interprets us. God's word first works on me and interprets me. We'll say some more about that in a minute. But we do have the task of like, wow, you know, Paul writes to a church in Corinth 2,000 years ago or thereabouts, and gosh, it helps to know what was going on in Greek culture and in Corinth, and what was that city like, because we want to know what it meant then before we say what it means today. A quick example, we'll get to this way down the road, but for instance, many Christians like this church and our denomination, so to speak, our national church, believe that it's good and right for women to preach the gospel and they can be on the church council and be in leadership positions. other christians reading the same book say no no it says right here women can't do that well i believe when you really look at the culture of that time and you look at how jesus treated women you look at how women were the first evangelists you look at the fact that paul in romans 16 calls a woman an apostle i believe um and Phoebe a deacon, and by that time, deacon was not a uh, just a servant. It was a position. Um, there's lots of reasons to say this is good. Women should be able to follow their calling to preach and lead just like men would be. So that's a way to say, well, this is what it meant. Now, how do we say what it means? Um, you know, and so, so that's part of a fancy word called hermeneutics. It's like the process of how do we apply what the Bible has said? Now, at this point, before we get to the inspiration issue um, and what we mean, like Kyle was asking, but what do we mean by inspired? And there's some other words that Christians have put on there, especially since um, 
the Bible's kind of come under attack um, in the last 200 years that it doesn't have it right about this, this, and this, and this. And we use kind of more modern ways of critiquing literature. And so Chris, some Christians in response have said, no, the Bible's inerrant. There are no errors yeah. and it's infallible. And so we've added some words and some of them are helpful and maybe some aren't. But um, just before I get there, here's the question. Um, is the Bible clear? Are the scriptures understandable? <laughs> Christie's, no, I've read some of it and I don't understand. And that, so my answer to my own question is no and yes. There's lots of stuff that are a head scratcher, but the core stuff is crystal clear. You're justified, you're made right by faith not by works, lest anyone boast. That's clear. Jesus lived the life of a servant. He died on the cross for our sins, was raised to make us right. Clear, straightforward. I don't need an interpreter. But this is what the, and this gets a little bit ahead of the game here. The, uh, when Luther said, script, not only faith alone, but word alone and scripture alone, as opposed to the Pope, the Catholic Church came running in and said, the scripture is too unclear. We need the church and we need the Pope to tell us the definitive word. And Luther said, no, we don't. It's clear. It's right there. Okay. So, so that's, but yeah, of course, there's stuff we don't understand in this big book. But the, the root, the course thing is not unclear. So let's, let's uh, do the, uh, the, um, the inspiration issue. Really, it's a matter of authority. If the Pope isn't the the man, the person that has all the authority, and the Catholic Church doesn't exclude the scriptures, they just say the Pope is, you know, the one that, you know, is the the go between, I guess, and um, and is a and the Church's tradition goes alongside the the Bible. They work together, and and uh, Luther when he did his reformation said it says right there in the bible that you can't do that and the church said just shut up luther the church says <laughs> the church says so you know luther wanted to have a debate we'll get there next week i can't stop it <laughs> i can't stop wanting to go there okay um but really we want to ask where does the bible get its authority kyle so that's a perfect question does it get its authority by being a perfect book with no errors, no problems, no issues. Um, and I want to say that's not where it gets its authority. It gets its authority because it brings me Jesus Christ and the resurrection of Jesus. That's because of that event. Now the rest of this has authority in my life. So the perfection inerrant theory and circular is a little bit of a circular argument. And this is what I mean by that. Um, how do you know the Bible's inerrant? Because it says so. Well, how do you know? So it, so the Bible says it's inerrant, but how do you know it's inerrant? Because the Bible says it's inerrant. <laughs> so you get into the circular argument, and then you get into battles of, you know, do you really believe in the Bible if you think there's an error? Like, and what, I'm, what am I talking about here? Well, maybe... Uh, Maybe a biblical author said a town was here and it actually is over there. I don't know. You know, and the scholars come up with these things like, oh, this guy got it wrong. Oh, does that mean the Bible then we throw it out? You know, that's my concern about inerrancy. If you could, and I don't even want to go there, like prove that this, you know, was this author was mistaken or something about something. That because that's not where the Bible gets its authority. It's you know, I, I think it's a good debate to have. Jason, yeah. Okay, this is an argument I've had a bunch with my mom. Yes. I, for the longest time, like the Bible, they say it's... Okay, I'm, what I'm saying is over the however many thousands of years the Bible's been on earth, right? Yeah. There's been preachers or or people of faith or whatever that weren't so proper that I 
think have manipulated the Bible for their own ideology or something like yeah. that. Mm -hmm. But now what you're saying, and and I I don't know if that's true or not. I yeah. just that's yeah. what I always thought. Yeah, no, very helpful. None of that matters though. Um none of it matters that it's if if even if it has been manipulated in certain ways because the message is still there about Jesus. So well, even if they mess with it, it's still good. Okay. Right? Um it doesn't take away from its authority that some people have misinterpreted and misapplied it. They've used it for selfish gain. That even the devil quoted the Bible to Jesus. So if that's what you're saying, I'm not sure if it is, that people throughout history have made this say all kinds of things that maybe it doesn't say. Yeah. Yes. Well, manipulated it Manipulate. their own ideology. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's called reading into the text rather than letting the text. <laughs> and, and even if that's the case, though, it doesn't matter. It doesn't discount this, that some people have abused it. Okay, cool. Absolutely. Because that's been a struggle of mine for a long time. Absolutely. Too. I thought you were going to, yes. And then there's another related question to that that we, we can talk about. Okay. Yeah. It was the valid one for me. It's always been, what about the councils? How do they decide which book? There were a lot of books that yeah. didn't make it in, some didn't make <laughs> it. How do you reconcile all that human decision? Yeah. What's what yeah, ended up in the that. Bible? Yeah. What's that? I read about I know that. Oh, yeah. Nice and count the Council of Nicaea, all those councils, yeah. Constantinople. Uh huh. How do you, how do you, you know I'm over that. I do. And I just love it. The adult Bible study has been going into serious depth about the Bible. I don't know if you guys have been in adult Sunday school. For the With the exception of two of those sessions, that unfortunately, because the devil messed them up. No. <laughs> the devil uses technology again that were not recorded. They are all on YouTube channel, our Silverdale Lutheran. Yeah, they're really interesting. And it's and called The History of the Bible. Check them out when you're traveling or at home and you want it, you don't want to watch another Netflix thing. Turn on our call up our Silverdale Lutheran YouTube channel. You'll find it, the history of the Bible, Ron Hoyam. He definitely goes into a lot of this stuff. But since you asked, I'm gonna give you a non-huge, you know, uh, explanation. Kyle asked about when did they decide what books are in, what books are out? Let's talk about that. I just to finish though with the inerrant infallible thing. I like infallible better than inerrant because I don't I don't want to get caught up in the discussion about whether every little there's nothing you know from a human perspective that it gets it wrong. I think that's it's a fool's errand. Now infallible to me means trustworthy. I like that word. I like that because okay. it's trustworthy. <laughs> I can trust. That the gist of the matter, what it's telling me about God is true. And the reason I believe it's infallible and trustworthy is because I believe that Jesus is risen. So that's good. Now, let's go to the councils. Um, and before I talk about the text itself. Um, okay. Here we go. When did the Bible become the, let's talk about the New Testament. We know the Old Testament was in place uh, at least a couple hundred years, maybe 300 years before Christ comes on the scene. Um, but the New Testament, how do we decide which books are in and out? And how many of you have seen Da Vinci Code? Come on, admit it, raise your hand. All right, that's fine. <laughs> so um, I forget how long ago, um, we've always heard about these from some of the early Christians and their writings. Other gospels, like we got Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Well, there's a gospel of Mary Magdalene. There's a gospel of Thomas. There's a gospel of, it's not gospel of Peter, but something about Peter. Um, there's uh, a gospel of Judas. You know, it's like, what? You know, and so the Da Vinci Code and Dan Brown, uh, by the way, it's a completely fictional book, although Dan Brown <laughs> says he thinks otherwise, but. He, he is the master at making you think that something means something when it doesn't. But nonetheless, in that movie, in that book, he has a bunch of older men in a smoke-filled room deciding what books are in and what books are out. Right. Mm -hmm -hmm. Um, one, the Council of Nicaea didn't even talk about the canon. 
they were talking about the divinity of Christ. So that wasn't even talked about in the Council of Nicaea, with the exception of one thing, which I'll say in a minute. That was later in the Council of Constance that you talked about and others where the church said, okay, oh, these are the books. And there was some discussion. There was some disagreement on some of the books. Those books are Second Peter, Jude, Revelation. These were books that had some controversy and debate about them. But not enough to keep them out of the canon. And in, in the Council of Nicaea in 325 AD, Constantine, who the Roman emperor, becomes a Christian of sorts, I guess you could say. And his mother is definitely a Christian. And uh, he's like, we, you, the churches, we're all reading these books. Which books are the books? Um, and he didn't want a necessarily a decision, but he said, I want a, I want a, I want a collection because I want these books to go out to all the empire. So he said, but the problem as the bishops and the leaders of the church, we haven't ever decided which books are in and out. So what, this is what they decided to do. It's so brilliant. And it's so cool. They got together and they said, which books is there no or almost no controversy about? It's called a minimalist canon. And they came up with those books. And in three lines, three columns, and four, it says in threes and fours. And I'm pretty sure that means three columns. And you'll see a picture of one in a minute. Three columns and four columns on each page. By that time, they were doing the Bibles on animal skin. And they're all handwritten, of course. So that's what they did. And they picked out... What books is there not an issue? And guess what books are still in the New Testament canon? Those books. <laughs> um, how did, where was the choice? This is what I want. I really believe this strongly, Kyle. And I really, the church decided not at a council, but through use. The four gospels, as far back as we can go, were the ones that Christians were reading as the authoritative word. Yeah, there was this gospel of Thomas we heard about. We didn't even have a copy of it until just, I don't know, I forget when the Nagamati library is found, but we didn't even, we heard people talk about it. We didn't have a copy of it. And if you read it, you go, this is bizarre. If you read the gospel of Judas and some of these things, it's like, whoa. And we know historically too, as we look at the writing and we look at that they're late, they, they, they were written, 250, 300 year, 300 <clears throat> AD. So, so in other words, even though there was at a council at some point, they said this, these are the books, they didn't have much of a decision to make because the church had already through use begun reading certain books of scripture and not as others. And here's the other fascinating fun thing. Um, we, you, you see this book here? That's what we, everything we have and now electronically, of course, but is in the book form. This is called a codex where you, you know, in the ancient codexes, they had papyrus, which was a, 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 a plant that they smashed and put together to make paper back in the first century. And even before that, it was the ancient paper. And what they did is they came up with an ingenious way to fold that papyrus and then put different choirs that, you know, so each one together and sew them together and they made a book. Mm -hmm. And almost all, when we go back and find our oldest manuscripts of the New Testament, they're all in codex form. But guess what? That was not the norm. Mm -hmm. The norm was the scroll. We see early on that all of the sacred writings of Christianity, they put in, they were always in book form. They weren't in scroll form. These Gnostic Gospels or these other Gospels, they were always in scroll form. So it shows us that, and guess what? It's the only time as one Dan Wallace, a famous uh, textual scholar, uh, says it was the only time in the history of the church we were ahead of the technological curve. You know, I mean, because we're always lagging, you know. But we, in, we didn't invent the book, but we put it on the map. Christians did. And so... So that the answer to that question is a complex one, and Ron goes into it a lot in that. But what, what I want to say is that just through use, it was already decided. It wasn't a bunch of smoke guys in a smoke-filled room saying, I don't like that gospel. Let's get that one out of here. We want to, uh, there's another book out by, uh, oh man, he's been so impactful and it's so sad. 
Um, Chapel Hill, um, North Carolina, Chapel Hill, Bart Ehrman. He's written all kinds of books about this. And he basically says when his one book is called How Jesus Became God. And his thesis is that the Christians never thought Jesus was God. Early Christians, the disciples, mm -hmm. the, the followers of Jesus. And then the church over a history, hundreds of years said, we're going to make this guy out into a divine being, into God. And so he he basically says that, you know, at the Council of Nicaea, they were like, okay, these other books say Jesus is something different. Let's get rid of them. The church had already gotten rid of them because they didn't read them. They didn't believe in them. You know, they didn't read them as scripture. So, so that's really a great question and really helpful for me to say. All right. We are going to have to skip this next section, and but we'll come back to it, okay? Because I don't want to just give you a head trip today, tonight. We're going to talk about the Dead Sea Scrolls at some point. We're going to talk about New Testament manuscripts and all of that, and but we're not going to do it tonight. Sorry. Because I want to get, oh, this is the New Testament stuff. I'll explain all these different things because I want you to know that Going back to Christie's question, the translation you have is, I think, a very accurate giving to you of the originals. But again, that's being challenged today. I want to talk about that. So principles interpretation, we've already done that, really. But bottom line, let me say this. When scripture is unclear in one spot, we then go to another spot. We let scripture interpret scripture. There's you know, and so that's a really important thing. We do try and understand it in its original context as best we can. Um, and but but I want to get to in our last 20 minutes what the word does. You know, we're talking about the Bible. My goodness, let's talk about what the Bible does. What does the word of God do? All right. So um Art. Yeah. Okay, so what happened just now when I said Art's name? Besides his, you know, getting a little, you know, his blood pressure going up. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> what happened when I said your name? I'm guessing other people were like, oh, it's not me. We all looked over. No, it's not me. I'm good. Everybody else yeah, was yeah. relieved. Yeah. That's true. Okay. <laughs> but you looked up, a connection was made. Guess what the word does? Makes a connection. It makes a connection between us and God. We need God to make the connection because we feel disconnected. All right. Um, it, but then you might say, well, what's the what what's the nature of that connection? Okay, so now it doesn't not just gets our attention, but it says who God is. Is God a tyrant? Is God a sleeping God? Is God an absentee landlord like the deist and Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson thought? He's an absentee landlord. He gave us inalienable rights and laws, and he's out, he's out of here. The watchmaker. The watchmaker, yeah. Um, what is the nature? And the biblical story says God is love, and God does love us, and God is absolutely committed to being in relationship with us. And that's a part of the connection. So that's what the word does. And it talks about the nature of our contact. Um, and so what does the word do? It really is that which creates faith, sustains faith, and nurtures our relationship to God. So that's what the word does. And now, how does it do that? How does it nurture our faith? How does it keep us connected to God? We're going to talk about a certain lens. Everybody has a lens that you read the Bible through. We read it through our own personal experiences. But I want to, so we can't not look at it through some lens. And this is the lens that we look at the Bible through. And it's the lens of law and gospel. So I'm going to unpack law and gospel in our remaining 15 minutes or 20 minutes. That's our lens. In fact, Martin Luther our namesake said that if you don't understand the difference between law and gospel, you are not going to be able to read the Bible correctly. 
you're going to throw in the towel or you're going to read it and think you're all perfect and become a hypocrite. Mm -hmm. um, you're, you're not going to get it right. You have that God speaks to us through his word in two distinctive words of law and gospel. You need to distinguish those. All right. So let's, what is that? So law and gospel. Um, you brought your Bible, some of you. If you uh, can turn to the first book of the Bible, which, and flip over to the third chapter. And if you don't have it, it's totally fine. I think I can just put her up here for you. And we go over here to here. And let go. Genesis 3, 8. So um, just to review the story, God created everything was good. God created Adam and Eve. He, gave, he put them in a garden that was beautiful and wonderful and it had a tree of life where they could eat from it and live forever. But God put one limitation in the garden, the, gar the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, don't eat it. Don't eat of this fruit. Well, the old tempter, I, 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 the serpent, it's a... In the Bible, in the Genesis, it's the snake or the serpent, but I think the devil was speaking to the snake. Mm -hmm. I don't think snakes are evil. <laughs> um, but we get this tempter coming, and the tempter starts with Eve. Has to work quite hard with Eve. Like, did God really say that? And no, he just knew you'd be like him if if you eat of that tree. So that's why he said that. Don't believe that, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and on and on. And then Eve does eat and gives the fruit to Adam and Adam just was an easy, <laughs> uh, and he eats. And so they do what God said not to do. And this is where we pick up in the story. And I want you to hear this to understand what we mean by law. Now, what do you think though, before we start reading, when you think of law, what do you think of? Rules, mm -hmm. right? Ten Commandments, rules. Drive 60 miles an hour on Highway 3, or you will get in trouble. You will get a ticket. <laughs> um, you know, I don't, don't, no, no need to confess. That's all right. Um, you know, boundaries, rules. Yes, that is law, but we want to go to what do those laws actually do to us? What, how do they function? And this is a good story to help you with that. We're going to do two stories to help you with understand what we mean by law, the scripture, God speaking as law. Yes, God has standards and rules and guide, you know, boundaries for us to live by. Um, but what do those laws do to us? That's and what does the law do to us? Let's read. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and the, his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. Okay, wait a minute. What? Why do you hide? Because you're scared? You did something wrong? You're guilty? Right. Other words. Ashamed. Survival. Survival. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Now, remember, just before this, everything was good, and they had all this, and everything's beautiful, and, and God is walking, notice the very uh, human, earthy, God is not some, God is walking among the garden in the cool of the day. He's right there with them, and now they are hiding. So when scripture gets us to start thinking about where, what's going on for me, and look what God asks, asks and he said, um, you know, uh, um, but the Lord God called the man and said, what? Where are you? Did God know where he was? Yeah, but doesn't every mom do that, though? Like, or dad? Yeah. Like, with their kids? Like, where are you? Where are they you? Know where they, you? They know where they are. They're that, just like, you better come out here. Yeah, that's right. God knows where Adam and Eve are. So where, what is he, who's he asking the question for? Them. Right. Where are you? 
when you read the scriptures and you go, where am I? Am I in unbelief? Am I in anger? Am I in bitterness? Where am I? Am I hiding? The scriptures working on you as law. Of course, what does Adam do? I heard the sound of, now I'm going to do a little oral interp. You can decide if I get this wrong or not. And I heard the sound of you in the garden. And I was afraid. Um, 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 oh, because I was naked. And I hid myself. Now, yes, now he, they know that they're naked and they have this. Is that why he was hiding? Maybe part of it. No, he's hiding because of what you guys already said. He he blew it. They blew it. And they're hiding. They're running away now. Now, the Bible does say that the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. But this is not that kind of fear. In the Bible, our kids, our confirmation kids with Pastor Jonathan came up with a perfect word. It's awe spectrums. Say that with me. Awe spectrums. Awe respect and reverence that's biblical fear that's the good fear awe respect reverence this is like i'm terrified i'm out of here that's what happens when you know you've blown it and so god comes almost like hunting for them you know uh, this god who is good now they're scared of every little leaf noise you know and and so they're hiding and then adam comes he, he just April used perfect by using the parental thing. You know what? If it's tough when you only have one kid. If those of you who are only ch children, I'm so sorry because you didn't have another kid to point the finger at. <laughs> you know. Um. So you know who did it? I've got two dogs. You know, and sometimes they get in, one of them gets in the garbage, and I'm not putting a camera up to find out which one did. But you know, I mean, so you know, he comes up with an excuse. And so, who told you that you were you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Verse 11, the man said, the woman you gave to be with me, she, it's her fault. <laughs> That's what I said, of course. <laughs> of course. The ladies know this is nothing new. So, what does he do? God comes to him and he points to Eve. Okay, well, let's go to Eve. The woman you gave to be with me, she gave the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this you have done? The woman said, it's the snake's fault. <laughs> the snake deceived me and I ate. Um, yeah. Interesting, interesting, interesting. Um Linda, I think you said, what did you, I thought I heard a word, what you just said, scape, did you say scapegoat or escape? I don't know. I, I thought, I thought I heard you say. I said it's always someone else's fault. Right. <laughs> so first they disobey and then they what? They blame. They, and they deny. There's actually one word that they will not say. It's the shortest word in the English language. No. Not that, no. Shortest word. Uh, mm. they won't say i oh. i did it they point and in fact somebody else got blamed did you catch that god god this is adam the woman you gave you gave it's your fault god Wow. There's one word when the Bible comes, when you read scripture and you go, oh man, I did it. See, God's trying to get them to say, I take responsibility. And what we see is something gets exposed. Our denial of God, our blaming other people, our blaming even God. It's your fault, God. When scripture comes and you go, oh man. That's law. Here's another great one for those of you who have your Bibles and you can find uh, 2 Samuel. This is one of the most famous scenes in the Bible, 2 Samuel 12. 
This is after another lovely person in the Bible, King David. 2 Samuel 12, verse 1. You remember King David? Some, a lot of, we got a lot of religious background here. So King David was a, God, a person after God's own heart. He, God had pointed him king, said no to Saul. David's the king. He's done all these great things. But, you know, power corrupts and what? Absolute power corrupts. Absolutely. King David sees beautiful Bathsheba bathing down on a rooftop. What he's doing up there in the first place is a question instead of being out in the battle. But he sees her. And of course, as adultery, some people believe it was worse than that. Uh, it might have been even forced himself on her. And of course, he is the king. So nonetheless, he's done this. And he's even done worse. To she becomes pregnant. And because of that, he thinks... I can fix this. I can cover this up. And he sends her husband. He, he sends for her husband from battle to try and get him to lay with Bathsheba. So it'll it cover things. Then. Yeah. <laughs> what, yeah. What's that? I said it started then. And it, it started then. It's still going on. I know. All you have to do is turn on reality TV, right? Yeah. Uh, or The Bachelor or whatever. <laughs> or The Bachelorette or whatever. So, um, he won't do it. You're right. He won't do it. Mm -hmm. He's too devout. So mm -hmm. he comes. He won't go into be with his wife. But so David sends him back and he says to his general, put him on the front. Mm -hmm. So he'll be killed. Mm -hmm. What do you call that? Murder. Mm -hmm. King David has had adultery and committed murder. But is he feeling sad and bad about it yet? Yeah, no, he's doing what Adam and Eve did. No, I'm fine. Here comes the prophet. Here comes God's word. Look what happens. And this is a man after God's own heart. Right. So. This gives me a lot of peace. There you go. Like, How so? Selfishly, this gives me a lot of peace because I mess up every day. And I don't know that God would ever say that I was a woman after his own heart. I mean, I don't know. Yeah, maybe. right. But. I mean, David is, the, is is written as a man after God's own heart, and Look what he, does. he takes advantage of a woman going through a purification <laughs> ritual when he knows that she's ovulating. I yeah. mean, that's why she's having that ritual back. Right, right. And then he's like, I know how to cover this up. Homicide. Yeah. Um, now, I don't think that any of my sin is any greater or lesser than anything that David did here. But I can say that knowing God's forgiveness and the depths of his love for me, this gives me a lot of peace that there's nothing that I can do that would separate me from the love of God. Yeah, beautiful. I mean, when you read the Bible... It makes you, me not want to commit homicide. Yeah, you that don't, much. that's good. That, that's a good thing. We don't want to do any of the <laughs> things David did. <laughs> but when we read the characters of the Bible, we go, wow. I thought everybody in the Bible were all these perfect saintly people. Mm -hmm. I I don't think God can accept me. Oh, yeah. And he's a man after God's own heart. I know. That's right. Mm -hmm. All right. So, but, but God is concerned about this. It's not like God doesn't care. In fact, God is very upset about it. So he sends Nathan, which is a prophet, which is the word of God. Look what Nathan does. He came to him and said to him, uh, David, there were two men in a certain city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb, which he had bought. And he brought it up and it grew up with him and with his children. And it used to eat of his morsel and drink from his cup and lie in his arms. And it was like a daughter to him. It sounds like my golden doodle. <laughs> Sorry. Um, now there came a traveler to a, the rich man, and he was unwilling, though, to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the guest who had come to him, but he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Well, then David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he stood up and said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die, and he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, and he had no pity, Nathan. And Nathan says, you are the man. Hmm. 
the most, the per, when we talk about God's word coming to us as law, this is it. When you, and sometimes that happens when I read the Ten Commandments and I go, hmm, you shall not bear false witnesses to your neighbor. And then when I realize what that means is that I should put the actions of others in the kindness of lights, I go, I'm the man. Didn't do that. Jason, you were talking earlier about, you know, I love your neighbor with all your heart, soul, and mind. Is that gospel? No, that's law. When I hear Jesus say that, I go, oh, yeah, I didn't do that. You might even say, well, the Ten Commandments say you shall not murder. Yeah, thankfully I haven't done that, but it also means you should help preserve somebody else's life. Well, I haven't done much of that, or I haven't done as much as I could. So scripture comes and you it hits you and it says, you are the man. The thing that Adam and Eve won't say. But thankfully, that's not the only way scripture comes to us. But so many Christians and so many people in the world think that's what the Bible's mainly about. Rules. Never forget. We're going to go over just a few minutes. I'm sorry, but we got to finish. We got to get to the gospel. But I'll never forget in my neighborhood, as we moved in, moved all across the town in Lodi, a little bit bigger house. Our kids were getting older. New neighborhood. It's a hot summer California afternoon, and Sandy and I are. Well, around noon and we we're going for a walk we went around and we came around and the neighbors two houses down from ours were out they were you know there was a group of people they're having a party and they were drinking some beer and you know having some food and and sandy says wow that looks so good can i have one of those now here's the thing they knew somehow that i was a pastor and you would have thought you know <laughs> you're asking you're going your wife is going to drink a beer and i said yeah me too <laughs> give me one of those now i know that alcohol is poison to some people and i'm not disregarding that but what do what did they think a pastor and christians are about Law. bingo people think that's what the faith is a bunch of rules and regulations yes that's important but here's the thing you know what those rules and regulations are supposed to do first and foremost yes they set a boundary for your life and help you live and so things are good we need the 10 wouldn't it be great if our whole culture respected the 10 commandments you know we wouldn't have to lock our doors at night and blah 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 but but that's that's a part of what the law does but the main thing the law does is it makes us say where are we are we believing and trusting in God? Are we running from God? Are we hiding from God? Are we just, are we, you know, it says you are the man, you are the woman. But then right when that happens, God's word also comes to us as promise and gospel. Um, in the Old Testament, there's tons of gospel. Guess what? God would forgive David. Now there were consequences to what he did, but God forgave him yeah. because he repented. Psalm 51, the most important confessional psalm in the Old Testament, it's David crying out for forgiveness. So right when we get hit with the law, God right then brings in the gospel. Yes, but I love you and I forgive you. And as much as the law has done its work and we're really sorry for our sin. I forgive you. That's what repentance is, is to be sorry for your sin. And he then gives us the gospel and gives us forgiveness and grace. Um, there's some great past stories in the, um, this is one I love. Jesus was uh, in the synagogue on the Sabbath and just then appeared a woman with a spirit that had crippled her for 18 years. She was bent over and quite unable to stand up straight. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said, woman, you are set free from your ailment. He didn't ask her, you know, do you believe, do you this or that? He said, woman, stand up. You see, when Jesus touches us and forgives us, the law bends us over and knocks us down and we feel rotten and our conscience is inflamed, and we're feeling like we're, oh, I, I, God isn't going to accept me. That's right at that point, God brings in the gospel. That's what Jesus came here. And sometimes Jesus preaches the law himself. He said in the Sermon on the Mount, you must be perfect like your father in heaven is perfect. Are you serious, Jesus? Yeah, he did. He said that. 
that the, that's the standard of the law. You think you can keep the law? Well, there you go. Be perfect like your father in heaven. No, Jesus preaches the law. He is the gospel. And he says those things. Yes, to get us to strive and, you know, but mostly to get us to come to the foot of the cross. Remember how we talked about what the gospel, the event of Christ with its significance? That is what the law does. It says, you need this. <laughs> you need what Jesus did for you. Um, lots of scriptures, but we're over time. So I'll finish with my little story here. Go back to my PowerPoint here. Um, there are some passages I was going to read. The Corinthians one is about God reconciling us to himself. It's very important that you know that the law and the gospel is in the Old Testament and the New Testament. It's, the new isn't the gospel. The old isn't just the law. It's probably weighted more that way. It's a different covenant. We'll talk about that at another time. But um, let me give you some illustrations of what we're talking about here. Um, oh, so I put that little heart there in the bottom. Uh, many years ago, uh, I was had a Valentine cartoon um, brought to my attention. And I kind of stand up to do this. So the um, the first, it was just two frame cartoon. The first frame was a man, his arms crossed, and but he's he's kind. Of, it's really a great drawing because he's he's kind of proud and angry at the same time. <laughs> and he's in a room, and it's all boarded up. Every window is boarded up. The door is boarded up. He is safely locked in. That's there he is. So God's going to send the word. Okay, next frame. Same man sitting there and he's looking down. And underneath the door, someone slipped a little valentine. <laughs> That's the word of God. We are locked in, proud, mad. I can do it my own way, like Frank Sinatra said. Or like Fleetwood Mac said, you can go your own way. I love that song. You can go, yeah. But... Sorry, if you don't want to <laughs> fleet with Mac, it's fine. But anyway, that's where we're at. We're I'm independent. I'm tough. I'm strong. And and God's word comes to us. There it is. Okay, one last story. Um, because this is life to me. I almost threw in the towel on Christianity because I didn't understand this distinction. Because when I was honest with myself, I didn't keep the law. I wasn't, I was trying my best, but I knew it didn't measure up. I mean, and I was like, I can't do this. I mean, I, I was so on fire for the Lord. I prayed three hours every night with my friends. I'd fall asleep praying. And that was fine. That was good. It was great. It was a time in my life. But I just was like, I was going to be Jesus' follower if it killed me. And it almost did because I didn't know the gospel. I just knew the law. So um, any of you guys remember Mayberry RFD and Andy Taylor? And some people, some of you are too young unless you watch, um, uh, you know, reruns. You should look it up. If you've got young kids, there's some stuff that you might, but that's a great show. Anyway, um, Andy Taylor's the sheriff. Opie is his son. Um, what's Opie's real name? Uh, Rob, Ron Howard. Ron, Ron Howard famous movie director now well he's got his start he was just this little andy taylor's and i know we're five minutes over this is short so um one episode and then there's aunt b so andy taylor he's not married i don't know if his wife died or whatever but he's the sheriff in the town and he's raising his little boy opie and aunt b lives with them and it's kind of the i actually andy's the law and aunt b's the gospel and opie andy there, it was the young, uh, take care of the poor kids fund at school. Like everybody's to bring some money, some change to for the poor kids. And, you know, so Opie comes, you know, sauntering into the sheriff, you know, uh, office and, hi, Paul, hi, you know, and, hey, Opie, you give the ch needy children fund. He's, oh, yeah, Paul, I did. And he goes off and then comes in the first grade teacher. to tell on Opie because Opie only gave two pennies. <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and he's incensed. My son, the son of the sheriff, is going to give more than two pennies. And so, scene cuts, dinner time. What's the name of the show? Uh, Mayberry R.P. Oh. Uh, Andy, uh, Andy Griffith show. Andy Griffith show. It it's is. eight Mayberry is the My town. My husband happens to be Andy recording Griffith that right show. now every day. Oh, I love it. When you <laughs> find, when you find this episode, yeah. remember which one it is because I want to get it. All right. So here's the scene. So Opie's sitting down at dinner, and in that day, when you got in trouble, what happened? You had to go upstairs without any dinner. That's that was the thing. So, but before that happens. Andy's talking to Opie and like, I heard that you only gave two pennies and Opie starts to say, yeah, Pa, it's because, and he, and Andy won't let him get a word and, you know, and he just, no, you're the, this, you've got, you make enough, you get an allowance, you can get more than that. That's, I am so disappointed in you. I'm so upset in you that you did this, et cetera, et cetera. And he keeps going and, um, and he just won't let Opie get it. But Pa, but Pa, and he's trying to explain and he says upstairs and he goes upstairs, no dinner. And B looks at him. Aunt B looks at him. Don't you think you should trust your son a little more than that? Ooh. If he said he can't, don't you think? You know, and she just lasers into Andy here. Andy here. And Andy says, okay. And so he calls Opie back down and finish your dinner. And says, yeah, but I, I still don't understand why you didn't get more. And then Opie finally gets out. Yeah, Pa, because I'm saving up to buy a jacket for Susie. <laughs> okay, now why did I tell you that story? To tell you this. Right in that moment, the word came to Andy as law and gospel. What did he realize? I not trusted my son. But what did he realize at the exact same moment? He could trust his son. Law, gospel. We the law shows us you haven't trusted God, but boom, here comes the gospel. You can though, you can trust, and that's what Jesus is all about. It's helping us know we can trust Him. Let me close with a prayer. Sorry for going over it. Thank you, God, for this great time talking about Your Word and another great start in this great group. Uh, be with us as we go forth from here, and uh, be with us until we meet again in Jesus' name. Amen. We will uh, we'll pick up again next week. I'm going to give you a schedule. There are a few weeks coming up where we're going to have to skip a week because of other commitments and things. And then we Holy Week is Thursday, you know, Monday, Thursday. So anyway, sorry, I really do apologize for going 10 minutes over. We'll, we, thank you. We, thank you for that grace, for that gospel. <laughs> uh, we'll, uh, we'll try and do better with that. But. Uh, really, you're probably 638. 6.38.30, so we finished early. Yeah, we did. <laughs> All right, very cool. No, it's the end of the program.